Good morning and welcome to Bermuda Tech Summit. My name is Kathleen Ferris, and I have the honor of introducing you to Professor Hasso Plattner. Hasso is the co-founder of SAP and founder of the Hasso Plattner Institute. He graduated from the University of Karlsruhe with an advanced degree in engineering and began his professional career in 1968 at IBM. Four years later, together with four former colleagues, Mr. Plattner founded the enterprise software group SAP. Today, that company has over 100,000 employees worldwide. In addition to his business career, Mr. Plattner is passionate about research and science. Since 2004, Mr. Plattner has been a professor at the University of Potsdam and is a member of the board of the Stanford University School of Engineering. His commitment to forward-looking technologies and innovations extends far beyond this, however, and in the summer of 1998, he announced the founding of the Hasso Plattner Institute for Software Systems Engineering. The first cohort of students began their studies just one year later. Mr. Plattner now not only finances HPI, as head of the Enterprise Platform and Integration Concepts Department, he also made a personal commitment to research and teaching. I could continue on with Mr. Plattner's ongoing commitment to arts and culture, in addition to the long list of honors and awards he's received. However, if I did that, we would not have any time at all to hear from the man himself. So with that, welcome, Mr. Plattner. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us and share some of your insights. We are truly honored to have you. Thank you very much for the introduction. So when you left IBM back in 90, uh, 1972 to form SAP, I was curious to know, you know, what were you passionate about back then? What were you trying to really accomplish or deliver with SAP um, back in 72? Yeah, it, 72 was a good time to leave IBM. It was the, uh, the starting point of uh, a new generation of, of hardware concepts. Uh, we just got it within IBM um, the, um, the uh, screen as a terminal. It was a character screen. Um, we had uh, relatively good computers, no comparison to today. Uh, we had large disk storage, relatively. And we thought we can build the standard business applications new from scratch using this, these technologies. And the cornerstone was we wanted to do um, accounting, purchasing, sales. We started with sales actually um, as online real-time applications, real-time in a sense that everything was happening instantly and not in traditional uh, batch uh, jobs, which run overnight, and then you have uh, the results on your table the next day. So we started that. Um, we got a large contract by a famous company, which is now defunct, a British company, ICI, Imperial Chemical Industries. Uh, that was our mothership. And uh, we built the system for them, the sales system. It was a huge success. Uh, we were running from, despite we have left IBM, we were running now from conference to conference to explain what we did and how we did it. And, uh, and we got a second large contract from ICI to develop the rest of the applications, purchasing and sales. Um, and that was the foundation then for the first uh, batch of SAP systems uh, with this so-called system R1. We reached probably 100 customers. Um, at the end of the of the 70s and then we felt now we know better how to build a system and we have to do it again right uh, since we were a small company um, probably at the end of the 70s 40 people um, we thought um, we, um, we we start uh, with a very small group um, of radicals because uh, the majority of the company didn't want to do a new system because we were just really becoming successful with the first one. Um, we convinced them and um, three years later, 82, 
uh, at the beginning of 82. We had a new system, R2, the second version, and um, technology-wise advanced, uh, much more functionality, but unfortunately, less business. Um, there was a strike in the um, metal industry in Germany, mainly automotive industry, mm. and all of a sudden, uh, we didn't sell. Mm. So, so what did you do? What, what how did you change yeah. the strategy? We lived on the reserves, so no money for the five founders, uh, zero, and all money we made um, went back uh, straight to the to the employees, mm -hmm. and we even paid a uh, a bonus. So they didn't feel they they knew something, but they didn't feel the pain, and. Uh, and shortly after that, the industry came back and uh, we had a roaring success with R2. R2 went up to, I think, close to 2,500 customers. Wow. Uh, we started to become international. Um, first of all, uh, ICI brought us to the US, to South Africa, to Australia, and obviously to Great Britain. And so all of a sudden we were an international company, not so easy for a German software company in those days. Um, and uh, knowing that the next generation is necessary pretty soon, uh, I started already in, 80, in 85, um, in the third year of, uh, or fourth year of um, R2, what can we do next? And uh, the, we got the first customers from the US. I will never forget a meeting with uh, Mobile, Mobile and uh, they wanted to bring us to the US. And I said, you will never bring us to the US because R2 was programmed to a large extent in a, a language close to the computer in the assembler mm -hmm. language. And uh, that was banned in America in those days already. Oh, really? Uh, they brought us to America, we started. Um, we uh, got quite a few companies uh, at the East Coast, uh, mostly chemical industries because of our relationship with ICI. So SAP started in the US. And um, in 80, 89, um, IBM announced some uh, new directions for their application software. We picked them up and instantly uh, started the next generation of SAP based on a database with an SQL interface, based on a programming language C um, and a graphical user terminal um, instead of the character terminals. And uh, um, now we got quite a few um, developers who were interested in such a modern application. And um, in 92, um, we had the first customers. Uh, we changed our pricing scheme. Be careful with pricing schemes. Um, and we only got small and mid-sized companies in Germany. And um, we were again running into a brick wall. And um, I was sitting with my colleague Dietmar up in his room and said, what can we do? And I said, okay, Dietmar, I take the software and go to America. Probably I find larger customers in America than in Germany. Right. And that was then end of 92, 93, and the, um, the rocket started. Then it was going up uh, at uh, 80 degrees, 75 degrees. It was probably the most exciting time of, of my career. Uh, every August, uh, we had already the revenue in from last year. So the um, rest of the year, um, we, were, we were working for the growth rate. Um, growth rates of 60%, um, then you don't need much management. You just hang in and hold on. And uh, um, so we, we were extremely successful in um, the Bay Area. Uh, we got one large customer after the other. And uh, the consequence was we had to develop like crazy because they had more and more uh, requests uh, for our functionality. Our trademark was still... Um, that we did everything as much as possible online and in real time. And we did it on so-called client server computing. So many computers um, right. were brought together um, and we distributed the, the workload. 
um, between front end and the database and uh, the application logic. So it was a very successful concept which run through the 2000s. We managed the Y2K problem. There was no Y2K problem. Uh, it didn't happen. So the, the software worked the day before and the day after. Um, and then we celebrated a little bit too much. So this is good enough. This is uh, now we have to uh, hone it and uh, um, just make it incrementally a little bit better. Um, in 2003, I left uh, the uh, CEO post and became chairman. And shortly after that, as you mentioned, I started at the University of Potsdam. Um, my student got bored when I talked about uh, what we do at SAP. And I, I felt the next, the next thing is coming. And uh, it was not really visible, but Intel came to me and said, what do you think about if we have um, computers or, or, or CPUs which can run multiple threads physically parallel? So the innovation, of course. And I said, okay, fine, and we have more capacity, it's, it's nice, but I can't really help you. Probably go to the gamers, they can use that. Yeah. Um, shortly after that, um, the main memory got bigger. I got bored at the university and in 2007, I started a project at the university at my chair um, to develop an in-memory database. Everybody says in memory, every, all data are in memory and processing is much faster. And everybody said, oh, this is only for very small companies. And I said, so what? University, we do a program, we do prototypes. And if they work in small companies, that's okay with me. There are many small companies in the world. Um, and we always had, in all our life till then, we had problems with performance. Um, companies always had too, too much data and processing was too slow. Right. So we had to tune the system very uh, cost intensive um, and labor intensive. So now we developed an in-memory database and uh, after, after a year we could show what we can do with that and it was absolutely sensational. And the good thing was then the then um, famous SAP CEO Leo Apoteca, he became famous later somewhere else in the world. Um, the, he said, okay, let's do it. I thought he will be against me and so you cannot do this from outside. So I got the charter to uh, run this project for a while. We built the database and uh, it extended the life of SAP by at least another 10 to 15 years. And then we have to do something new. Um, the database is today under, underneath all applications. Uh, the success is uh, uh, by far higher than we ever expected. Right. We solved the performance problems. We can do new things. We can run much larger companies now, much larger data volumes. Uh, all of our, is, is cloud a big part of that? Is, yes. Was that a game changer? That came, that came basically in parallel, the yeah. cloud. We started a cloud project in SAP early in the, uh, in the low 2000s uh, together with Intel um, and it was too expensive. Mm. Uh, whether the computers were too expensive. And anyway, Intel asked uh, to shut down the project. We shut down the project. Um, it was for small companies and the, the costs were too high. Um, we, we have to accelerate. Um, the, um, so, so we came then back to uh, cloud computing uh, a little bit later. Um, our first product we did was not a um, flashing success, so we had to buy uh, companies and uh, integrate them and the integration of companies grown up differently of, on different platforms is, was and still is a problem. So that's, that's the history. Um, what, what's, what, what is probably um, interesting is you, whenever you think you have reached a point, you are under control. Now you can optimize cost and uh, optimize profit. This is actually the point in time where you have to rethink and either rebuild the platform right. or do something additional. Um, you cannot continue for too long 
once you are on the plateau. So maybe uh, so, so let me ask another question about that because you know I'm I'm hail from the insurance industry. We always have these uh, conversations about you know should you completely disrupt yourself and and so around this concept of of systems and legacy systems do you think it's better given where we're at with cloud for a company to think about just sort of starting over and building something using the cloud and migrating their data over or should people really still continue to try to you know re redo their architecture and and existing infrastructure so first of all with the cloud there's a humongous advantage uh, per definition in the cloud the manufacturer of the software is maintaining the system and we all are now maintaining the system basically on a continuous base. We update our systems every two weeks for the first 10 customers, then for 100 customers, then for 1,000 and more customers. That makes the software um, much more uh, adaptable to the changes which are happening in the world because mm. uh, the manufacturer has to do this and can do this. Software on-prem easily gets older. And when it has reached a certain point, now it's very efficient cost-wise for the, for the CEO, um, but it's probably not the best um, strategy yeah. for longevity. Um, so that is taken away now from the, uh, by the uh, manufacturer. Uh, so software stays more modern, stays more relevant at lower cost, which is huge. Right. Um, and then uh, the, the elasticity of the software implementation so that changes in volume can be uh, accommodated much more easily. Um, um, we can handle very large uh, data systems in the cloud. So the trend to the cloud is, is everywhere. More or less everybody is going there. Uh, the cloud is as safe as an on-prem installation and um, has, as I said, has from a structural architectural point, clear advantages. Right. So, so maybe let me take you into the future a little bit and, and knowing everything, all the advances that are happening around AI and machine learning, et cetera. What, what, do you, what about what tech can do for society excites you or inspires you? And then also the flip side of that, where do you think that we need to sort of be concerned or be diligent about where that might take us? Now, finally, in the recent years, AI has a breakthrough, um, mainly because the computers became so much stronger. The CPU, regular CPU can have now 24 cores, can run 24 threads in parallel. If you have a computer with four CPUs, then you have nearly 100 threats in parallel and we can have even much larger computer and then we can have multiple computers next to each other. Um, so we have nearly unlimited compute capacity. Um, main memory has grown uh, sufficiently so that we can uh, cope with large companies in memory. We can condense the data by a factor of five or more. Um, that enabled us to um, to make AI successful. 20 years ago, we played with AI and it didn't go anywhere. It was too slow. Uh, we couldn't do enough. Now machine learning is standard for every large uh, software manufacturer, uh, for every large uh, user of software, whether it's aircrafts, cars or whatsoever. We all run now machine learning um, programs. Um, this is a real breakthrough becomes basically standard technology for all technical and business um, computing applications. Um, we have fantastic user interfaces now. When I look at the pixels of my commercial iMac here, uh, this, is, uh, this is unbelievable, but you know this is what happened with television. Um, 15 years ago, I am a fan of hockey. I couldn't see the puck moving. Uh, today, I sit in front of a 4K screen if they uh, send it in 4K and, and it's nearly as, uh, as a live uh, picture. Um, so we have unbelievable progress. 
first of all, we should think that the progress continue. It's, uh, continues. It's not a plateau we reach. It's probably an acceleration which is coming because the whole world is now working on technology, not only a few companies. Think about uh, the Asian companies. Um, so more will come and we have to be ready for that. So you see this in the household with Siri and Alexa uh, that we are now talking to computers, which is faster than typing, which we can do from, from any position. Uh, especially when we do more work at home, I, I think uh, and, and a voice interface uh, will be the next thing which, which will be standard for all applications, um, which frees us again and uh, make the whole computing, uh, working with a computer a little bit. Uh, more human and um, but we have to be aware that within the next few years uh, there will be another major technological breakthrough breakthrough which changes everything whether it's um, in, in new ways of uh, building computers um, I, I, I don't know I do not believe in so much in quantum computers, but I should never say never. <laughs> Just a year before I said Unix is Nix, I changed in the company everything from IBM to Unix. Um, so things are happening and uh, are going to happen and we have to be aware of that. When you hang back for too long, it becomes more and more expensive to jump on the bandwagon. Right. Um, the, uh, it, is, it is always difficult to convince a company, let's take my own company, we have to do a new system. Why do we have to do, we have a good system and we have to do a new system. A lot of naysayers are there, but the company has to jump. And then it has to have the energy of the company behind. And you can see this in the history uh, of, of Microsoft, uh, of basically any large company living now for nearly 50 years. Uh, we have to do this, otherwise we are becoming irrelevant. What are you excited about in the future of tech and, and for young people that are gonna be getting now more and more involved in technology because every company is gonna be a technology company. What are you excited about when you, when you get over here? In general, uh, probably, more when I fly over and read something. Um, for the first time in my career, we have an abundance of technology. We, we basically have cheap enough technology to do nearly anything we want to do. We do now a P&L statement for a large company in three seconds. Um, if you want to change something in the P&L, uh, either enter um, new data or change structures because you want to report differently, you can do it and boom, you have a new PL statement. Uh, the flexibility is, is, is unbelievable. For the first time, we are really limited by what we can design. It's not what we can build and how it runs. In the old days, it was we had to make compromises, otherwise, it doesn't run. Um, this is great. Therefore, there is such a huge opportunity for many, many new startup companies to build something because the platform to build on it is cheap. The platform goes everywhere in the world. With the first version of an English program, you reach already probably 30%, 40% of the world. And then you do the other 99 languages you have to do. Um, the location in the world, um, this helps Bermuda, doesn't, doesn't play so much a role. You're connected from any point in the world. Right. So even on an island like Bermuda, you have a chance to reach out uh, to, to other places. Um, and, and work the, the first 10 years, I don't want to complain, but how many nights I had to work because only at night the computers were available, became available. Wow, yep. Um, so my tennis really suffered. Um, 
private life was minimized. Right. This is this is not the case anymore. You have you have this infrastructure available twenty four hours. So it's your choice when you um, start and kick in. Um, so the world has become significantly better, and it will continue to do so. So. Therefore, I'm very optimistic uh, for the people um, who are young now and study. And I can only tell them, learn, learn, learn. Not for the marks in school. That's, that's a beside. That's only a test. But for your life, because um, what you have learned, nobody can take away. And it becomes, in most cases, a prerequisite uh, for a career. Everything is going digital now. Right. Um, that that's that has happened. Um, this is not coming. This has happened. It's only that we become aware of it now. Um, and uh, I have great hopes that we can improve. For, this is where I privately invest um, in digital healthcare. That we can improve healthcare substantially. Right. And um, we work together with several. Uh, large hospitals, and uh, I have uh, directly in the finance from the by the HBI six chairs, three in America and three in Germany uh, for digital health. And I hope that we can make together with all the other ones who are doing this uh, significant breakthroughs in research, in uh, um, that we can study the effects, for example, of vaccines. Uh, much faster than right. we traditionally do this. So we will continue to make the world better. Yes, it will be a little bit more complicated. It will be a little bit different than our normal uh, applications or manual work. So yes, therefore you have to study. Well, that's a great way to wrap up our chat. Hasso and I, I thoroughly enjoyed meeting you and speaking to you and uh we look forward to having you in bermuda yeah thank you kathleen this was uh nice meeting you